on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We bring you the latest updates from OU training camp and make our bold predictions for OU players this season. In the National College Football Roundup, we discuss our thoughts on the announcement of the Alliance. To finish up, we give you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hostie, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Thursday, August 26th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and your health and safety are Riverwind's number one priorities. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently vo- voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And every night from 6 p.m. to midnight, August 1st through 27th, you can win your share of $300,000 in cash prizes and bonus play in Riverwind's $300,000 Riverwind Winiversary. That is a lot of money. If you need help finding your way, just visit riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, simply the one. Now we're recording this Wednesday night. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment while you're at it. Ted, you can almost smell the season. It's so close. (laughs) <laughs> we are getting close dude we're we're getting close to game week uh that road opener is interesting we got some things brewing in the gulf of mexico <laughs> there is well, there's there a is chance a... we play our our road opener at home let's go that would be that would be something and for those of you that don't know, there is there is a storm of brewing in the Gulf of Mexico, and we'll see where it heads. But when you think about New Orleans' past with hurricanes, like it's not out of the realm of possibility that a tropical storm could make it New Orleans' way. Now we're not hoping that happens. Let's make that perfectly clear that that city does not deserve that we don't want a hurricane to hit new orleans ted however it would be interesting if those conversations start having to take place with what's going on weather wise my hope is uh we have an abundance of caution decide to go ahead and move the game Turns out to be a false alarm. We play the game in Norman. No harm, no foul. Somehow Tulane is made more than financially whole. And we come out just absolutely beautiful on the other side. That's the that's the best way to go about things. I do not want to play the game in Norman and New Orleans get destroyed by a hurricane. Okay. You're right. Just so just so we make that very clear to the listeners, but would be awfully convenient if out of an abundance of caution, that game was played in Norman. And then our friends in new Orleans were just fine, but Josie doesn't know this, but already made the call earlier today that we should just go ahead and move it now. So I'm sure Tulane has no objections to that. (laughs) They could probably end up making money out of the deal somehow, honestly. Yeah, probably. Hey, if, if there's money to be made, a, a deal can be made. Okay, let's get to the OU stuff, Ted. Uh, probably should start with this. Reports that running back Marcus Major, this comes from our buddies at Sooner Scoop, will reports that he will be academically ineligible for the season. Uh, this is something that has been floating out there for quite some time now. A lot of people have asked why we haven't talked about Marcus Major when we're talking about the running back room and the offense and well now you know why you know we haven't brought him up a lot and you want to have as much depth as possible at every position but certainly 
at a position as physical as running back. So maybe the best way to describe this, Ted, is not ideal. This is not ideal. Yeah, it's not. It's it's not necessarily a problem right now, but at running back, we've seen before that it doesn't take much. I mean, just within a game, a guy can go down with an ankle, nothing severe, but he's over on the sideline uh, maybe for the second half of the game. The other guy, who knows, could get a targeting on special teams or something. You never know what might happen. And then all of a sudden, you're down to one running back, and it's a guy that is talented, no doubt, explosive, no doubt, but we just got no game experience. We, we, don't, we don't know if he can hang on to the football, if he could be trusted in pass protection. So not an issue right now, but if, if things go bad, it could be an issue really quickly. Heck, I mean, you're talking about a COVID test and a, you know, who knows what might happen. That's kind of how thin you are right now at running back. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point. Bringing up COVID. Like we, we thought that COVID testing, you know, wasn't going to be much of a factor this season. And it's becoming clear, whether you look at college football or the NFL, that that is certainly going to play a role. Yeah. So uh, number one, I'm, I'm really disappointed for Marcus major. I, I love supporting the local kids, right? And he went to Millwood right here in Oklahoma city. And I was really hoping he would get his chance this season, but this is, this is something that he only has himself to blame for, right? It is, it's hard to be academically ineligible. It's hard, man. With, and you, you and I both went through it with, with all the resources that Oklahoma provides you. It's almost, it's almost like you have to try. So I, I don't know anything about his academic history or anything like that. I just, I wanted to see the kid play. And if he's not out there because he didn't take care of his stuff in the classroom, that is a damn shame because I was excited to watch him play. And then this makes Trey Bad Bradford, the LSU transfer, very important now. And from what I've heard about him, he, he's raw doesn't have a full grasp of the system yet. I mean, they, they asked the running backs to do a lot, but as one coach put it to me, he is fast as shit. <laughs> so that's this always is a, a great place to start. That's I'd rather be fast than not. So uh, this is a guy that is capable of ripping off some really big chunk runs. So it, it'll be interesting to see, what type of role Bradford plays now because major is out of the picture, but just not really what you wanted for Marcus major, but Hey man, I mean, you, you, it's a great reminder that as even as college football is starting to feel more and more professional, right? You still have to take care of your stuff off the field or you cannot play. And yeah. unfortunately, from the sounds of things, Marcus Major didn't do that. Yeah, and it's frustrating. You know, I echo a lot of the things that you say. I think he is a really good all-around back. I think he, he's physical. He can get the, the tough yards. I think he's pretty good in the open field for breakaway. He's capable out of the backfield. He's capable in protection. He's a guy that's shown up for them in, in, on special teams, multiple different units he's a good all around football player and all good teams have to have a bunch of good all around football players that maybe don't see a whole lot of uh, reps during the week. Maybe don't see a whole lot of reps on the weekends in games, but whenever something arises, they can be depended on to go in there, execute, do their job. And uh, I felt like he fell into that category and every good, like I said, every good football team has a bunch of those guys and, Again, not an issue right now, but it doesn't take many things to go wrong before you are really in a bad spot at running back. And do you think like Jeremiah Hall would be a guy that would step in and help fill that role at running back if if it did get to a situation where you lost a couple of guys? Yeah, remember when Dimitri Flowers did that? Yeah. 
Uh, uh, see, and it doesn't take much. It takes an off the field issue, an ankle, and then you're handing off to a fullback for an entire game on the road. Yeah. So I'm sure, and you know, maybe something crazy happens and Marcus Major becomes eligible. Maybe that happens, and I hope that happens. But you you have to have contingency plans, right? I mean, you you have to cross train some of those guys. Maybe maybe you stick Braden Willis back there. I mean, he's wearing nine now, Ted. Ah, and, single digit guy. That's true. And I, you know, going back, I've I've seen them hand him the football out of the backfield before, and we may hey. have even seen it once last year. So. Iron Man football, he put the Bowman kid back there. Let's get it. I guarantee you that is being discussed. <laughs> it's only a matter of time till Lincoln Riley steals him for some offensive duty. And yep. this seems like a uh, like an awfully convenient scenario for him to get Bowman a couple carries. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know what – they've got contingencies, obviously, and there's a couple other guys – uh, left in there in that running back room that they can obviously go. Yeah, to, weatherman, but... the weather weatherman Jay. Yeah, the Knowles kid. I like. I mean, uh, I know that you you don't want to make too many sweeping assumptions off of a spring game performance, but he looked good. I mean, he yeah. looked like he looks like a guy that if you're in a pickle, you can hand him the football, get you some yards. Yeah, I, the really only way to really wrap the whole thing up is to say disappointing. Not an issue unless it becomes an issue, you know, I, I, I can, it'd be hard for me to find a scenario where we're looking back on this season saying, well, if Marcus major, you know, had been eligible, things would have been different. Yeah, no, I feel you on that. Okay. Other rumors that have been floating around for a few weeks, uh, concern Wanya Morse's eligibility. Uh, there are some rumors that maybe Tennessee was holding some things up. I see a hype. That's that's another discussion for another day. <laughs> but this is what we know. Wanye Morris is practicing. He is in the OL rotation. He is battling for a starting job. He is getting valuable reps with the ones and twos in practice this week which leads me to believe they are expecting him to be available against Tulane. I don't think at this point in time, they'd be giving him reps with the ones if they didn't expect him to play against Tulane next week. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, reps are, they're hard to come by anyways. You, you've got a limited amount of time with these guys. So you've got to divvy them up. You don't just throw away practice reps on guys that you don't expect to be out there or have. I mean, even if there's a a 50-50 chance that he can't play in the opener, you know, you'd be you'd be taking his reps away right now and giving them to someone else. Uh, you just couldn't afford to until you had a final decision on that. Yeah, yeah he'd so, just have to be over there and you know getting the middle reps. Yeah, so that that's encouraging. And I I will say this, OU compliance gets a lot of grief, right? People give them a lot of shit, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the biggest compliance departments in the country. They do their job at a very high level, a frustratingly high level, some would say. But I do think they, they played a big role in helping Wanya Morris out. So give OU compliance a little, Hey, way to go team. Because I, I do think that they were, uh, they're very helpful in that whole ordeal. So just want to give them a shout out, right? Because th- no one ever compliments the compliance department, you know, that is the weakest golf clap I have ever heard, sir. That's all they get. I apologize, okay. but they do get a golf clap. Okay. I thought you were going to say, I apologize for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, but that's good. I mean, I, I, that's a, a weird world to be living in the compliance and the academic eligibility. And it, it's a whole world. I don't even know what to say other than 
I'm glad he's there. I'm glad he's ready to play. And there's likely a scenario, whether he's a starter or not, that he's going to play a ton of reps this year. Yeah. Hopefully nothing changes between now and next Saturday, but we'll see. Okay. Ted, any other really significant, exciting developments from the last couple of days of practice for OU? I, the only thing really that I've heard is that all of a sudden, after kind of an up and down camp, that Reggie Grimes just is a monster now. So that's yeah, that's, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, I. There's so many guys that are playing well on the defensive line that you've heard good things about pretty much everyone, right? We've heard, we've heard about some of the young guys, some of the veterans, uh, you know, everyone guys that were out last year and are now back. We've heard a lot of stuff about a lot of guys, but for whatever reason, Reggie Grimes wasn't one of the names that was being thrown out there. It doesn't mean that he wasn't performing well, just kind of seemed to be a little bit lost in the mix. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's a bunch of stories coming out and he's, you know, just crushing it, which is not a shock. I mean, he's got all of the tools. Absolutely. So, and they've been feeling that way on him for a while now. He played, he played a bunch last year. So uh, a full off season, grow into the the body a little bit it's not a shock at all yeah so now i'm i'm really excited to see him next weekend because you're, you're right he he had he'd come up in some of these conversations but over these last couple of days i mean it's been like dude he's he's murdering guys so that's that's that is new information so i'm i'm interested to see what his season ends up turning out like and with all the depth along the defensive line I want to hear that about as many dudes as I can. And that, that was really encouraging because he is one of those guys that just, I mean, he looks the part, right? Yeah. It's what, it's what you, it's what you want your defensive lineman to look like, Ted. Isn't it crazy though? We've talked about, you know, the, uh, just looking the part defensively, right. And having the big long bodies, the creatures up there on the line of scrimmage. This team looks so much different than they did three years ago defensively. And it's not even close, man. It's not even close. No. Um, going from an undersized team, uh, specifically in the secondary, but even across the line of scrimmage, not overly impressive physically, not the case anymore. Team looks completely different. Yeah, that's what you want. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We, we are doing our bold predictions for OU players this season. And this is clearly assuming guys stay healthy. I brought three. How many did you bring, Ted? Uh, I've, got, I've got three possible four. One of them is not necessarily for a specific guy. Well, I guess a couple of them aren't for a specific guy. It's kind of a position group. It's like a, it's a, um, a bold prediction that someone's going to attain this, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Well, you start, you go first. You have the honor, sir. I'm going to go first and I'm going to say this. We're going to have three true freshmen that are not just guys that play that are three of the main contributors on the football team. Uh, Mario Williams at wide receiver, uh, Billy Bowman at nickel, and Stutzman at linebacker. I think those three guys, and this isn't an easy team right now with as many guys as we have coming back to show up as a true freshman and get playing time and thrive and start. I mean, this is a deep team. People are picking uh, Oklahoma to go to the national championship. Can you remember a time or how often it's happened where a team has been picked to go to a national championship at Oklahoma and a true freshman has earned a starting spot or has earned a uh, massive rotational time that quick? That's not easy to do. There's some really, really good players 
in this recruiting class. And I think three of them by the end of the season, definitely going to be huge contributors, maybe even leaders in several categories on the team. Okay. That, that leads in perfectly to one of my predictions. And that is the Billy Bowman will be a freshman, all American and will be all big 12. Now, I'm not sure it'll be first team all big 12 because there's this one guy named Jalen Petrie who plays nickel for Baylor. Who's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, he's like our favorite player in the league, Ted, other than Mike Rose, of course, he may be, he may be my favorite player in college football. I mean, he, he's really good. So now if they just lump all the DBs together, maybe Bowman and Petrie can be on there together. They might but, do that. Five DBs. Probably that's probably how they'll do it. But it's it's just hard for a freshman to make first team all Big Twelve, but I think that with everything we've been hearing, uh, with the type of summer that he had, transforming his body, just this dude, he sounds like a dude, man. And I I'm expecting a high level of play from this young man. And when you do that, you end up on freshman All American teams. And yep. I, I don't even know if that's much of a bold prediction, but I just think he's going to be really damn good. He's going to be fun to watch, man. You could be, if you're a starting true freshman on a team that makes a college football playoff, it doesn't even matter what you did. If you start and hold on to that spot, spot all year, you're going to make the freshman all American team. Uh, that's pretty much a lock, which by the way, on that ESPN, did you see they put out their preseason? True freshman, all American team. I did. They put Savion Bird on there. So, Savion Bird's been coming along. Okay. Dad. He he's been coming along. He is now involved in conversations that he was not involved in a few weeks. Okay. Ago. See, I, whenever I saw that, I'm like. Uh, I, I talked to Gabe about the offensive line multiple times a week, and I just have not heard this name much. It would be a shock to me if he makes the uh, All-American team, but I was like, that doesn't mean he's not. Right. So, been, been a little banged up early in camp, but you know, once once healthy, encouraged by what he showed. Now, I'm not... I'm not sure how deep the tackle rotation is going to go, right? But this is the thing about freshmen. We could get midway through the year, and all of a sudden, he's gotten a lot better. Yeah. By practicing Once against that defense. Once things slow every down day. and you get into, like, game week, sometimes you can really settle in. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see. But, yeah, I've been, been hearing some, some encouraging things about him. Nice. So I saw that, and I was like, okay, all right. Now we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's not, nothing's going to be handed to that young man. You know how beaten bow operates, but we'll see if he can earn his way onto the field. Yeah. Okay. My, my second prediction or no, it's your turn. Sorry. You go. I went, you go, you go with number two. Well, I don't even think that this is very bold, but uh, Oklahoma is going to have the big 12 DPOY this year. Uh, it's going to happen. Rose had it last year. Um, I remember Grinch was saying that it's a it's a shame that Isaiah Thomas didn't get it. Um, we've got multiple candidates. We've got Benito. We've got Winfrey. We're going to have uh, a couple of backers that are going to have great years, in my opinion. A couple of safeties that are going to have great years. The DPOY this year in the Big 12 is going to come from the best defense in the Big 12. That's going to be Oklahoma. My guess right now, it's probably going to be Benito. I agree. I just think from everything we've heard coming out of camp and from the type of summer it sounded like he's had, man, I would be stunned if he doesn't have a massive year. And I mean massive. Yeah. Like somewhere in between like 12 and 15 sacks. Well, is what I'm I'll expecting. just go ahead and say it right now. I've got 
uh, we're going to have someone on the team have over 12 and a half sacks. So I'm putting the number at 13. Someone's going to hit the 13 number, which is not easy to do in college football, especially whenever you've got as many guys that are going to be rotating through as we've got. There's a bunch of dudes that are going to rotate through. That's that's that makes it tough. I also think so. I I know what you're saying when it comes to rotating guys through, but when it comes to Benito, it it is advantageous for him that he's got Perry on Winfrey, and he's oh, got yeah. Isaiah Thomas absolutely because if you're if you're the opposing team, like you have to make some decisions in protection and people may not realize like you, you set your protection plan. Yes, you do what you do and you run your protections, but a lot of your protection plan, like when you're game planning during the season is focused on what the defensive linemen on the other team are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So normally a guy of, Benito's caliber, like you're game planning. Hey, we're going to send a lot of protection that guy's way, right? And you tell a couple of your guards, or maybe you're picking a side or whatever, and you say, hey, you guys are going to be an island a lot this game. Well, that island now could be those two linemen and Isaiah Thomas and Perry on Winfrey. Right. No, yeah. Um, it, in as many games as OU runs up front, it's it's going to be crazy. The one thing I'll say is, though, um, I've been told that he's going to be like a 45 snap a game guy. Uh, it's That's going to be like his his max. He's not going to be an every single snap type of guy. And you know as well as I do, if an offensive coordinator is on the other side, they they convert a couple of first downs, they're six plays into a drive, Benito taps the helmet and jogs off on a running play. They ain't coming out of that personnel grouping again. They're not going to let the best pass rusher on the field come back in the football game if they can help it. So um, I don't know. It, it's a tough number to get, but I think he's capable. And like the push up front, the rushers that he's going to have around him, quarterback just is not going to be able to escape right and step up through the pocket and, you know, just be able to, to skate up and, and find some green grass to make throws the quarterbacks are going to be under a severe amount of pressure back there. I, I expect it to be that way. So yeah, I think, okay. Defensive player of the year coming from OU's defense and uh, I'm locking you into Benito. You got to pick a guy and you picked Benito. So that's, that's your prediction. I, it doesn't seem that difficult to make that pick right now. No, <laughs> not at all. Okay. My, my second prediction for this season Eric Gray will lead the Big 12 uh, of running backs will lead the Big 12 in all purpose yards so I'm talking I'm talking rushing yards and receiving yards I'm not talking returns I think that he will lead when, when at the end of the year if you take every back in this league and you combine their rushing yards and their receiving yards, Eric Gray is going to be at the top of the list. He's going to have more than Brees Hall. He's going to have more than B. John Robinson. He's going to have more than Letty Brown. Eric Gray is going to be that dude. Is this a last-minute hedge by you? Because on the rundown, it says Eric Gray will lead the Big 12 in rushing. I decided... Last minute as I, yeah, you're right. It's on the rundown. Thanks for pointing that out to everyone, Ted. Appreciate you. I decided that that would, that would make me probably right. <laughs> That's what I decided, Ted. I decided because I was, because as I was about to say it, I was like, well, they could hand it to Brees Hall 30 times a game and I could be screwed. But I, I do think, uh, I actually decided because, Hey, receiving sounds like it's going to be a big part of his contribution to this team out of the backfield. So yeah, no, I really just changed it. Cause I, I it, it made me, it, it, it sounded better to me. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Um, whenever you look at, you look at Najee Harris and what he did last year at Alabama, 
I mean, if if we're expecting the if we're expecting kind of the same system, uh, use Bijan Robinson the same way as Sarkeesian used Najee Harris at Alabama, they threw him the football bunch. He was involved in a bunch of things, and I would I would imagine that he's going to do everything he can to try and feature Bijan Robinson, who's one of the better skill guys on that team, maybe the best skill guy on that team. So it, it's still a bold prediction because, you know, Oklahoma has a lot of weapons to put to feed the ball around. They got multiple running backs. They got tight ends. They got wide receivers. So it's not necessarily a, a personnel issue with him, like a talent issue or a scheme issue. It's the fact that there's so many other options. Those other teams don't have nearly as many options as Oklahoma does. I know. That's why it's bold, Ted. <laughs> that's right. Thanks for pointing out that I changed it. No, Gosh. it's it's good. No, it's but fine. The, uh, you drove the bus right over me, man. I get the yep. tire marks are still on my back. That's Jeez. Right. Okay, what's your third one? Um, The third one, and... I thought this was bold at the time, and now I'm starting to I'm starting to worry that it's not that bold. I have that Mims will not lead in receiving touchdowns for this team. Uh, I thought initially, like he's going to be the go-to guy, he's going to be the deep ball guy. He led last year as a true freshman even though he didn't have what you would call like a high usage rate or target rate, like I would think that he would be the guy this year, but there's so many other people involved that I think someone from the pack is going to really emerge and maybe not necessarily be the go-to guy, but maybe be the go-to big play guy. Like maybe a Mario Williams, maybe a Mike Woods. I don't know. Um, I'm starting to feel like, maybe it's not that bold of a pick to take the field over Mims for receiving touchdowns. I, I think Marvin Mims out of all the guys on the team, right? You know, Lincoln likes to create a lot of shot plays for like one guy, right? He like, he, he finds that guy and he's like, all right, this is going to be my big play guy. I think Mims is that guy. So, I think, I think Mims will lead the team. Now, once again, this is assuming everyone stays healthy, right? I still think with how comfortable Lincoln is going to be dialing things up for him, those big explosive plays we're used to seeing from OU in the past game, I think those are going to be Mims plays. So if I had to, if I had to bet on one pass catcher to lead the team in in, uh, touchdowns, I'd, I'd, I'd probably still take Mims. Yeah. You know what I think is interesting is that we do hit on a bunch of like big play passing plays that are like, like called big plays. But I would say that more often than those, it's a extremely fast underneath wide receiver taking a relatively short throw kind of against the grain and turning it into a really long, a short throw, long yard after, yards after catch and turn it into an explosive play that way. And I, I feel like Mario Williams is going to be that guy. Kind of like a Mario a Williams is that guy. Yeah. It, that's, that's how like Hollywood Brown, he caught some deep balls, but most of his long touchdowns were caught underneath and win the foot race to the end zone. I feel like that's going to be Mario Williams this year. It's, so you're telling me that the hundred times Lincoln Riley dials up that play that you love so much where the guy runs the shallow cross all the way across the field and then <laughs> catches it at the line of scrimmage and everyone's already blocking and you oh, complain yeah. about it every time on the broadcast. You're telling me Mario Williams is going to catch a couple of those and, and do something with it? Yeah, possibly. You know, it is cheating, but if they're not going to call you on it, then you got to just keep running it, right? Got to do it. Well, they run it multiple times a game, Ted. And it's, oh, they uh, do. It's, it's pretty Well, they also do the one where um, 
you know, and they did this a lot with Hollywood. He would start kind of on the, as the, in trips, the inner wide receiver uh, closest to the core. And you'd run the other two guys off. He would go hard out, reverse back in across the field. The backside one receiver runs a deep post. And he's isolated on either a nickel or a backer. And he's running all the way across. And they hit him on the under. And he runs all the way around. And you saw that a lot with Hollywood Brown. I think that may be may one of those, be one of those plays that reemerges for Mario Williams. Yeah. I hope, I hope, man, the stuff we're hearing about Mario Williams, if that kid stays healthy, Ooh, boy, he's going to be fun to watch, man. Okay. My last bold prediction and by far my boldest Teddy, Mm -hmm. Chris Murray will be all big 12 at offensive guard. Mm, Okay. He is balling right now at right guard in camp we've in the past we've talked about some of the difficulties he was having at center you know it wasn't wasn't really grasping everything the position took and he doesn't have to worry about that at guard so the stuff that was probably affecting his level of play at center has now been taken off his plate and it appears that that just allows him to maul human beings, which is something he's good at and something he enjoys from what I've been told. So I think he is going to surprise a lot of people this season. And I can't wait to watch it, man. I can't wait with, with what I'm here, man. It, it sounds like he is just getting after dudes so i am i'm very intrigued so that's my boldest by far chris murray all big 12 at guard i love it hey you know whenever you kind of bog someone down with a position where they've got to communicate a lot they're thinking the there's a lot on the plate other than just doing what you're best at and love which is mauling guys in an angry manner then it's like you, you, you're just you're taking off the trainer wheels, you're taking off uh, the weighted vest, whatever it is, and you feel like you can just absolutely turn it loose. And um, you know what? There's there's probably also an aspect of he's got a much better understanding of the offense now, having had to see it from center to where he feels even more confident in some of those things before he he actually you know fires off into people. Definitely. That's definitely a thing. You're right. All right, let's get to our call your shot. And we we asked you guys the same question. What is your boldest prediction for an OU player this season? Our man, Red Dirt Sport, chimes in and says, Eric Gray is Oklahoma's Heisman finalist. That would be. Whoa. That would be. That would be bold and significant <sighs> and hard. It's just hard for a running back to be a Heisman finalist, right? I mean, it's it's possible. Clearly, I I would be I would be shocked if that happened. Shocked. Well, Najee Harris, you, like if you follow year, her, if you follow our man Red Dirt Sport on Twitter, he 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 is a shocking type of guy. Sometimes you know, I like he, that. Like you look at what Najee Harris did last year at Alabama, which I thought he was the best player on that team, and he didn't even get an invite. I think he had like 26 touchdowns and this is just an incredible player. Um, but, you know, there was some also some next level things happening out there. That would be a shock. If Oklahoma goes to the college football playoff, Spencer Rattler is going to be at that Heisman ceremony. Yeah. So that was bold. Uh, this one comes from Josh Robeson on Twitter. He says, Billy Bowman will be a first team all big 12 selection at nickel. Jalen Petrie stands in his way. Mm. Now, the thing working in Bowman's favor with that is, and it's something we talked about, right? They just kind of lumped the DBs together. Maybe they just picked their five favorite. Bowman could be in that five. And remember, this is the Big 12. They have a tendency to name like seven defensive backs, six linebackers, 
a defensive lineman to the first team all big 12. Yeah, it's like 20 guys. <laughs> 20 guys. A lot of co's in there. There's a, there's a lot of uh you know, a lot of awards given out by the Big 12. Okay, this one comes from Omar Tover. He says Jalen Redman will be first team all, all Big 12 and will work his way into being a day 2 draft pick. He's definitely got the physique he's got the capabilities he you just gotta see it for a season right we gotta see we gotta see it here's the thing man he's gonna have to light the fire because here's the and this isn't really a problem but it's a reality that he's facing on this side he's gonna have perry on winfrey on this side he's gonna have isaiah thomas over there he's gonna have benito it's going to be an all-out race to get tackles for loss. It's going to be a race to get those sacks. He's going to have to play ultra, ultra aggressive. I think I think he's having – I mean, there's a lot of movement and stuff from the defensive line. We ask a lot of those guys. And I think he's still in a little bit of a finesse mode, maybe feeling some of those stunts out instead of just turning his athleticism loose. If he does that, sky's the limit. And this last one, the only reason I'm reading it is because it comes from our man, Richard Spray. Spray yes. family sooners. Our man <laughs> Dick Spray is back, Ted. It's been a while. It has it's, been he's a while. Back and he says Rattler will win the Heisman while setting the single season QB rating record and will go number one to the Detroit Lions in the 2022 draft. The the crazy thing about that is I read it and I was like, eh, yeah, that's kind of the expectation, which yeah. is just ridiculous. Two of those things, he's the favorite, the number one pick and the Heisman, which is crazy. You just kind of well dismiss those. That uh, record for QB rating, I don't know what it is, but there's been some insane one. Like I don't know what Joe Burrows was in 2019, but it he was through like 78 percent completion percentage, something crazy. It, his has to be almost unattainable yeah all right let's move on to the national college football roundup but first let's talk money first fidelity bank is a full service financial institution based in oklahoma tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs checking accounts saving accounts home loans and much more they do it all whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone everything is stress-free with ffb making mobile deposits paying bills online and moving money to different accounts could not be easier First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. National College Football Roundup. Ted, the alliance is official. Kind of, I guess, maybe what, what was that? I mean, what, what did George Klyavkov, Kevin Warren and Jim Phillips just do? Like what, what was that? It was the most ill-conceived waste of time. Nothing burger we've ever seen. There really is no alliance. It's what uh, we looked each other in the eye is, is what it was, agreement. So there is no agreement. Uh, it's a bunch of talking points about what they want to do and what they want to focus on in material. Scheduling, uh, alliance, but the teams can still schedule outside of the alliance if they want. It's ridiculous. The whole thing is, it's totally ridiculous. 
it's try it's a move to try and posture and show some strength and they end up looking like absolute tools doing it it's one of the dumbest things i've seen i watched damn near all of it and at the end i was like can i get that time of my life back like i could have been doing something i I could have been doing anything else but okay so george kliavkov the new pac-12 commissioner let us know that there is no side contract that legally binds these leagues together they called it a gentleman's agreement uh you mentioned jim phillips the acc commissioner said that they looked each other in the eye. I I realize it, I, and I realize why there's not a signed contract, right? Because that may open the door for the current members in all of those conferences. Let's say Florida State, maybe Clemson, to try to get out of their current deals with some good lawyer lawyering, right? Where their lawyers could point to this new contract and be like, hey. That's not what we signed up for and try to maneuver their way out of their current deal. So they don't want to open that door at all. Also, they, they don't want any type of signed contract because they'll get sued in federal court, right? We all heard what Brett Kavanaugh said, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I understand for many reasons why there's no signed contract between the alliance however i also know that and i'm not a lawyer but i also know that if there's not a contract in place that this means nothing it means nothing no i also love that the day after they announced the alliance lsu announces a non-conference game with usc it was <laughs> I I got the notification, Ted. It's like the day after what? Oh I had just gotten off of radio. I had just gotten finished ripping the alliance for like two hours. And I got that notification and I just started laughing out loud. I was like, oh man, that alliance off to a strong start. You know, uh a long time ago, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. I was complaining, this will come as a big shock to you, Gabe. I was complaining about something that had to do with the government. I don't remember necessarily what what it was. No. But I was all incensed. This is corruption. This is, I I, I was mad. And (laughs) the guy I was talking to said, you know, I used to think that way too, but I learned as I got older that a lot of things that I thought were outright corruption and deceit, it's just people that really, really suck at their job. And I firmly believe, Gabe, I I honestly believe that conference commissioners, for the most part, I mean, Sankey's obviously doing a heck of a job. I don't think they're in touch with reality i don't think a lot of athletic directors are in touch with what their fan bases think of of what the college football world thinks of their teams and their conferences it's i cannot imagine an athletic director in the big 10 or pac-12 or acc that watched that and and leaned back in their chair and was like boy Let's see what the SEC has to say now, boys. Good luck, Sankey. Right? If anyone in any of those conferences thinks that, they should be fired. They should be embarrassed about what just happened. But I think that they're so out of touch that they feel like this was a really good idea and this is what we should do. I, I'm, I would be shocked right now if – Clemson and Florida State are on the phone like, uh, bro, did you see that? Uh, let's talk to Greg. We need to get out of this thing as fast as possible. That was a joke. It, 
it was just it was grandstanding at its finest right yeah because now i will say i am intrigued by the scheduling component of this but kevin warren said they're going to honor their current contracts when it comes to scheduling so i'm not even sure when we're going to see the alliance come into play when it comes to scheduling and this this part bothers me and a lot a lot of different parts of that announcement bothered me mainly the it starting with a loading screen and it was just like the screenshot of a computer and then it was the commissioner sitting in silence for 30 seconds and they didn't know they were on camera it it, it I wish someone would have said guys we need to pull out of this we can't before we go live let's just all agree to just pull the plug yeah but okay so the they, they, they said that this is happening basically because they care more about college athletics, right? They want to preserve the current collegiate model. They, they made it sound like they care more about student athletes, that they care more about academics and their student, student athletes getting their degrees that they just care more, right? That was like, they actually care. Not that not, we're not greedy like the SEC. And I was like, what the, what the hell are you talking about? First and foremost, the scheduling part of this, if, if you care about college football as a whole, right? Well, your little alliance is going to screw a bunch of group of five teams from playing non-conference games, right? And it's going to screw the remaining eight teams left in the Big 12. What is, is, is shutting those teams out? Is that good for college football? Like, there's a serious conversation to be had about that. So you have that. And then I, I don't know why they don't understand that the move that Greg Sankey made for the SEC is extremely beneficial to every single student athlete in that conference. Because this just in, the most important thing for the student athlete experience is bringing in a ton of money because then the school gets to use it on student athletes, whether it's facilities, resources, everything they, they pour it into their student athletes. And that leads to a very positive college athletic experience. So they, I don't know if they were trying to look stupid, but they were trying to make Greg Sankey, in the sec look bad. And I was the whole time I was like, wait, what? I, I mean, I was just very confused, Ted. It's hilarious. I, uh, these, these are supposed to be the smartest, the leaders, the, the guys that can get the deals done. And I would like to know, what the TV partners that they have think about them not caring about money and putting together good games, right? It's like, we've decided to water down our scheduling to conserve collegiate athletics. It's like, okay, you're, you care about the, the athlete, but you want to conserve college athletics. So, you want to stop paying the athletes. You don't want, you don't like the NIL deals and some of this stuff where people are going to be pouring the resources in. It's like, the, it's like code. They, they ran off the, like the laundry list of talking points that don't mean anything that you could ever come across. It is amazing. Inclusion, diversity, all Anytime anyone has to ramble off about all these things that they're they're really going to adhere to, they're full of beans. Just go adhere to them and we'll all see you, right? You don't need to announce to us all of these things that you're going to do. Just go do them. It's just, it's talking points. It's dumb. And I'm telling you, they are so out of touch with the football viewing world. They just have no idea. They need to... They need to widen their circle of uh, influence a little bit and see what the college football fans are saying about them. I, I just don't know why those three commissioners couldn't get up there and just tell the truth. 
because the truth is the alliance or whatever the hell you want to call it, it's about money and it's about power. That's the truth, right? This is all about, and they wouldn't even say that it was about OU and Texas going to the SEC. When we all know that's exactly what this is about. Yeah, someone asked that specific question and he just kind of danced around it, right? Yeah, it was Kevin Moore. He danced around it and didn't dance around it very well because he said like the college landscape's changing or something like that. It's like, yeah, OU and Texas are going to the SEC. That's the big change in the college (laughs) football landscape, Kevin. But it's about these three conferences showing the SEC that they aren't going to let them dictate every decision in college athletics. I don't know why they won't come out and say that. And it's all about money, man. It's not about the student athlete experience. It's not about this or that. It's about money. This is about getting as much money as they can when they expand the college football playoff. Like in the announcement where they were supposed to show Ted, remember this is, we are showing a united front, the alliance. Here we come. Here's our opening presser. Kevin Warren, George Klyavkov said, yep, we are definitely for college football playoff expansion. Jim Phillips, the new ACC commissioner, he goes, eh, we're undecided. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you. this is like one of the three main issues, guys. And they couldn't even pretend they were aligned on it. So I, as much as... As, as well as this thing reads where it's like, oh, they're doing all this great stuff. Like, I don't have any faith that these conferences are going to work together. Because guess what? This is all about money. And each one of those guys is going to do whatever they have to do to make sure the members of their conference get taken care of. They will run those other two conferences over with a bus if it means their their members get more money. And that's just the truth, man. I, I don't know why they they pretend. It's just stupid, bro. Because, like I said, they're out of touch. And they're not very good at their job. That's why I'm so thankful that Oklahoma has the best athletic director in the country. Because it was clear that the conference commissioner has no vision. The conference commissioner is not going to do what's best for the conference and the best for Oklahoma. Uh, putting this this conference forward, we were we were in in the in the very back. So we have a good athletic director that can read the room, that does understand the landscape of college football, do, does understand what fans want, and, and what generates revenue and what helps programs get better. So we left. It's not that difficult. Everyone else is, I don't know what they're doing. They've got their head in the sand. It's so funny because they're trying to take some like bold stand about the playoff expansion and not doing it until after 2025 or after the current contract is up. That's a lie. They're going to do it instantly. Why are they going to do it instantly, Gabe? Because they're going to make more money. It's Yay! the easiest thing in the world. You think the group of five schools are going to be like, yeah, screw the SEC. We're not, we don't want to be a part of the playoff until 2025. We want to we go to the Pinstripe Bowl and the Idaho Potato Bowl and the Jimmy Kimmel Bowl. We don't want to have anything to do with winning a national championship and getting a real chunk of the revenue we'll just let the sec continue to do what they're doing anyways i i'm sorry man i'm telling you it's laughable and the amount of money that some of these schools spend on their athletic directors and on their conference commissioners is a laughable joke they're sitting they must be sitting around playing golf i don't know what they're doing but they can't read the room they have no uh, the the ship is out the port and they got no clue. It it was it was very entertaining. I'll give him that. Because, you know, I was like taking notes and everything. Ted, I was like, oh, we're gonna get some good stuff out of this. But th- this was 
one of the favorite things that came out of it because there, there were some reporters who were able to talk to these guys like they, they could interview all three, like just them, one on three. And our buddy Ralph Russo got to do that from the Associated Press. And he asked, like, okay, so you guys are going to be aligned on these issues. You're, you're going to vote together. And Klyavkov was like, no, 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 this isn't a voting block. We didn't, we didn't agree to that. I was like, what guys, what are we, what are we even doing here? But I will say that. That's what I'm saying though. They, someone just wrote up a list of all of the current buzzwords and buzz topics of things that you need to be oh, for that release and reeked they, of PR firm. Yeah. And they just threw it out there and it's like, this is what we all agree on. And this is, you know, it's like, no, 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 we we actually don't agree on any of these things. We just wanted to list them for you guys. I will say I do hope because this will be good for college football. I do hope they expand the college football playoff as soon as possible and somehow get the new games. I don't know how the ESPN contract is written. I'm sure they've got a right of first refusal or something like that in there, but if they do expand, I hope they can get those games to the open market because that would bring the most money into college football, which would be good for college football. Right. Ted. ESPN is they're They're in the driver's seat. There's no doubt, but you don't want to blow up the whole thing by cutting everyone out for two years. You don't want to do that. Come in. Yes. We'll, we'll div divvy up the games. It's going to be awesome. We can all make a ton of money here. If they go in and just try and cut everyone off and, and wait for this thing to go out, it's going to end up costing them way more money to get the rights. It, it's, it's going to be, it's like Bezos could come in and be like, Oh, how much? Eh, uh, mm, uh, that's... A trip to the moon or I buy all of the rights of college football forever right here. Oh, let's do that. I like college football. I mean, you never know what's going to happen if you let it go go that way. So you negotiate it right now and let people have a piece of the pie and you keep it going. Dude, I'll tell you right now, there's going to be an expanded playoff next year. I don't care what any of them say. It's going to happen next year. It's not going to be the end of the deal. It's going to be next year. They're not going to sit around and say, man, we could all make so much money next year. But we sure don't like Greg Sankey, so let's all wait because, man, you know. It's let's not stick like it to him. Am yeah. I right, guys? It's crazy, man. It's, it's like you could see through the whole thing. You got caught sitting around not doing anything else and someone outmaneuvered you because everyone, at the end of the day, everyone just loves walking out to the mailbox and getting the free money. All of the teams, all these athletic directors, there's only like five or five or let's say 10 teams that are actually in the mix, right? That actually win games that devote a ton of money into getting their program better to pour in the resources, uh, you know, listen to their fan bases. These teams like pour it all in there. They go win games. They compete for championships and they make all of the money for everyone else. It's like the, it's it's the Big 12 on a bigger on a much bigger basis. I Maryland and Rutgers and all of these crappy teams in these conferences that have no fan bases, that people don't go to their games, their fans don't travel, no one watches it on TV, streams it on ESPN Plus. It's a joke. Everyone watches the teams that go out and compete but everyone else, all the other athletic directors don't want to upset anyone because they want to walk out there and grab that $50 million check at the end of the year out of the mailbox. So the Alliance is off to a hot start with us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I love let's, it. Let's move on to winners and losers. But first, do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing. Then we'll design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. 
best in class businesses win by avoiding the loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. And guys, summer is here and you know what that means. It is hard seltzer season, baby. And there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast. And that is Will and Wiley hard seltzer from Coupe Ale Works. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool at the lake and at the tailgate. It is made in Oklahoma and it is absolutely delicious. Will and Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in a store near you and go follow them on social media at, at Will and Wiley. If you're drinking some because of us, tag them, let them know. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? I thought about going with Sony Michelle. Um, was there at New England, got traded to the Rams for a couple of draft picks. And I got to tell you, man, I think this is an awesome move for him. They've had injuries there at the running back position in L.A. They brought Stafford in. They got a defense that is absolute nails. That team is in win-now mode, and they had to make something happen. We know Sony Michelle's a guy that can do a lot of different things. He's good in the, uh, the run game. He's good out of the backfield. I think he fits that scheme perfectly. Also, he doesn't have to play for the Patriots anymore. <laughs> which I think at this point, you know, winning's awesome. There's no doubt, but they don't have Tom Brady anymore. And it doesn't sound like it's the most fun time to play for that organization. That's just what I've gathered from gentlemen uh, I've talked to that have played there. Now winning's great, but I, I got a feeling, you know, McVay's vibe is a little different than Belichick's just a feeling. It does, it does get that feeling. That team's going to be really good. He's, I, I think that's going to be a, a really good fit. But I ended up going with, because I'm just enamored with this, I've watched it like 10 times, the drone shot from Hard Knocks. Is that not the coolest thing ever? It, it's amazing is what it is. Whoever... Like, do we know who was flying the drone? I don't, but that's like a legitimate occupation now to be a drone pilot. And they wear like a a helmet that's got like a display in it. Have you seen it? Have you seen them yeah. do like the drone racing? It's so cool. And I that was amazing. Now, some of the outtakes at the end were funny whenever, you know, he was crashing into stuff. But that that's just so cool. I mean, to think that, and I know that's, that's probably an expensive drone, but like, it wasn't very long ago to get like even an aerial shot in a movie required like a helicopter and like all of this crap. And now you got a little, little drone that's got an awesome camera on it and you can get shots like that. I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. I... I was blown away by it. Like it, it just kept was it, going and going well, and going. Was it just me? And if you haven't seen it, go watch it. There's this drone shot from hard knocks of the Cowboys practice facility. They call it the star. It's, I mean, it's so cool. Which was after you see the drone shot, you know, your way around the entire star. You see the, you see every single room, basically at, at any point were you like, Oh, this is fake. They just CGI'd this. Like at some point I was like, ah, that's fake. And then I was like, no, this is real. Is it fake? Is it real? Like it was so maybe disorienting is the wrong word, but like, I was like, what the hell is happening right now? As so, I was watching it, it was so perfect that it looked fake. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm yes. Like, that's a great way of describing it. Yeah. It, it was, it was amazing. I it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's m maybe the best two minute camera shot that I've ever seen <laughs> only only shitty part about it. And it was awesome. It was unbelievable. And kudos to NFL films. That was, it was so cool, but it's unfortunate that that was the best part of hard knocks <laughs> because this season of hard knock was a snoozer, man. It's so boring. Just yeah. give me all Jerry Jones. Just, I just follow Jerry Jones around because at least he's going to say something goofy 
funny, folksy, whatever you want to call it. Like, oh man, it's boring. And then he gets in his helicopter to leave the stadium after the preseason game. How awesome is that? They should get a drone shot alongside the helicopter. I don't have know. you have you ever seen? I, I, Probably wouldn't was, work. Now that I think about it, that would get do, caught in the yeah the prop. Yeah, that was a, that was a horrible idea I just had. Um, I've seen this drone footage of a guy that's one of the has one of the super fast ones, and he like goes back behind his friend that's on a golf course, and is timing it up with his friend hitting like tee shots onto a par three, and is like a couple of feet behind the golf ball and follows it from the shot all the way down onto the green. It is amazing. You want to talk about a drone shot that looks fake. I'll have to find it and uh, send it to you. Yeah, it's send awesome. that to me. It's cool. Okay, who do you have as your loser of the week? It's plain and simple. The naked baby from the Nirvana Nevermind album cover. One of the most famous album covers of all time. Uh, whether you like Nirvana, don't like them. Everyone knows the album cover. It's the baby that's swimming underwater and they've got like the dollar bill in there. And um, I guess it was 30 years ago. 1991 is whenever that picture was taken. The guy's name is Spencer Eldon. He was the baby. And he's recreated the picture uh, several times, like the 10 year or 15 year or something like that. He's done it a bunch. Oh, so he and, likes the picture. Oh, yeah. Well, you would think. Originally, um, his parents were paid like $200 for the photo shoot. And I think he got paid like a couple hundred bucks to recreate it, but he's now decided to sue the band uh, claiming that the picture is child pornography. Now we all know that's not the case. We all know that he's never had a problem with the picture. I can to a certain degree respect the money grab okay and he's asking for 150k from a couple of different defendants which maybe is smart because it's low enough to where they say uh take your money and and go but i feel like you should ask for more money courtney love is like estimated to be worth like $500 $500 million because of the Nirvana rights. I think you could ask for more than 150 K. So, so hold on. <laughs> He's not your loser because he is suing Nirvana for child yeah. pornography. He's your loser. Cause you think he's not suing them for enough. Yeah. Both. <laughs> I think, I think he could have asked for like 300 K from all of the defendants and go away money. You know, we know what this is. It's a money grab. Go away. It's going to cost our lawyer however much anyways. Take the money and go. I He's a loser for doing it, but he's also a loser for not asking for the right amount. Right, and he knows that Dave Grohl has been rather successful post Nirvana, right? Sure. That's right. That's right. I feel that like is- this is one of those because Dave Grohl every now and then he likes a, a bit of a stunt and I could see him like taking this thing and running with it and making fun of it and like blowing it up. Oh, somehow. I can't wait to hear him talk about it. I mean, it's going <laughs> to be awesome. gonna write a song about it. I, I will say this to, to anyone in a band that listens to this podcast you can you can put a naked picture of my baby on your album cover now it's that i'm telling you right now i have not told my wife that i would do this so the price is gonna be steep i'm talking (laughs) real steep but we can negotiate i will i will put my naked what nine year nine year nine week old son up up for bidding now i'm not going to put him go. underwater no 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 no. he's not ready for that huh well there you go Let's see if you get any offers ah uh, we'll see 
I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. This is all just a setup for me to have him sue them later in life. Dad. Yeah, 30 years down the road, you can sue them. Yeah. All right. Hey, new sponsor alert. New sponsor alert. Are you unhappy with the surface around your pool? Are you not pleased with your patio? Soft Rock specializes in installing safe rubber surfacing for pools, patios, gym floors, and other outdoor spaces. Soft Rock's rubber safety surfacing provides a long-lasting surface that is impact and slip resistant, fully customizable, and virtually indestructible. Local business owners Heidi and Cody Clark are avid OU fans that are driven to help you with all of your pool and patio surface needs. Visit softrock.com slash OKC. That's S-O-F-T-R-O-C dot com slash OKC for more information. The Clarks also own the driveway company. The driveway company has tailored solutions to eliminate all of your driveway problems. They can repair cracks, clean and seal your rotting grass filled joints to prevent water damage, ultimately saving you thousands of dollars in future repairs. Visit the driveway company.com slash OKC for all of your driveway repair needs. Learn more about soft rock and the driveway company by visiting their Facebook and Instagram pages or by calling 405-294-9834. And if you are looking to buy or sell a house in the OKC metro area, make sure you use the Ranallo Cloud Group. I just used them to sell my old house and it was so easy and stress-free. Stacia Ranallo and Maddie Cloud are with Sage Sotheby's International Realty. They believe in prompt communication, an honest relationship, and luxury service. And that's exactly what they gave me. You can reach them by emailing Stacia at Stacia at SageSir.com. That's S-T-A-C-I-A at S-A-G-E-S-I-R.com. Or you can contact them on Instagram at sold by Stacia and at sold by Maddie underscore. You will not regret it. Ted, for my winner of the week, thought about going with whoever flew that drone. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to do that one too. That was really good. But that that was awesome. And we were on the same wavelength, man. But I thought about going with Ramondre Stevenson because the Patriots traded Sony Michelle to the LA Rams. Did you see that quote from the running back coach? What did he say? Oh. Uh, he basically went scorched earth on OU. He said, I'll, I'm just paraphrasing right now because I don't have it in front of me. But he said, um, I don't know what they're doing at Oklahoma, but he was not ready to play in the NFL. Um, talked about he was out of shape. He didn't pass his physical, didn't pass the conditioning test. Like, <laughs> it's like, it said that I don't know what they were doing at Oklahoma, but they weren't getting him ready for the NFL. That's a bad statement. And there's usually, I thought there was like a good, like. It's got a lot of OU guys. A lot of OU guys and Lincoln has spoke highly of the Patriots. The Patriots have spoke highly of Lincoln in his office. They've like, or his offense, they've gone in and like exchanged notes. I thought that was crazy, but. No, you're right. Ramondre, definite beneficiary. Yeah. Uh, the former Sooner will get some more carries, maybe. <laughs> I don't know now after what that coach is saying. Good God. But my my winner of the week, J.R. Smith. I, dude, I love this story. And some people just remember J.R. Smith for the LeBron meme when he didn't realize that they were losing. <laughs> some may remember him as the guy that threw a bowl of soup at one of his assistant coaches. But he did make like over $90 million playing in the NBA. But he's my winner of the week because he is going to college, Ted. Remember, he went straight out of high school to the NBA. And if my memory serves me correctly, he actually played in the McDonald's All-American game that was here in Oklahoma City. And I'm pretty sure he lost the dunk contest to Candace Parker, which I'm just full of fun facts, apparently. But He still has NCAA eligibility because he came straight out of high school. Just has to be in a different sport. Can't be in basketball, obviously. And he is enrolled at North Carolina A&T where he has been deemed eligible by the NCAA to play college golf. He is 35 years old, Ted, and he is back in college to play some golf and to get his degree in liberal studies. And he's got the best part about it. He's got to follow all the same rules as his teammates, right? He's, he's going to study hall. 
He's going to 6 a.m. workouts. He's he's getting class checked. <laughs> like he's doing all this stuff that you and I went through. And I'm just imagining J.R. Smith, who's all who almost made a hundred million dollars playing basketball, is going through all that. And I I love it, man. I love that he's going to get his degree. He's trying to, and he's if you haven't seen his tweets about it, it's they're, they're fantastic. But I I just this is one of my favorite stories of the year. I love it. I I think it's really cool. I hope he. I hope he sticks it out. You know, um, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's never easy to play a professional sport, but whenever you're like a sixth man and you're making $12 million a year, it's not that hard to have the, um, you know, to get up early, to go do what you need to do. But when you're not making anything and those early workouts are calling at which, what are they making the golf team do at 6 a.m.? Um, but I, I don't know. I'm, I hope he sticks it out. And I wonder what their marijuana testing policy is at uh, N- North Carolina a and I, I would assume flexible. <laughs> I would assume flexible, but he, he did have a tweet and it said, everyone around the city keep asking me who you got doing your work. And he said, shit me lol i'm trying to learn something <laughs> i i just love it man i and i hope it would be so cool like if their golf team ends up being awesome i think he's a hell of a golfer so i yeah he's like a what was it he's like a like a four or five handicap or something like that yeah so i mean dude can play some golf and just getting his degree i love it i mean i i think it's an awesome story okay for my loser of the week Thought about going with Pistol Pete because this is, I mean, a a company called Quality Logo Products did a survey and Pistol Pete was voted the worst mascot in the entire country. Pistol Pete was voted the fifth most offensive mascot in the country and the third creepiest mascot. And their reasoning, they like did this thing where they announced it and they said, with this massive head, blank stare and disproportionately small body it's not hard to see why (laughs) every mascot has a massive head and disproportionately small body right isn't that almost like the point of a mascot to have the big head and that's yeah that's kind of the thing pistol pete what the fifth most offensive what what could be offensive about pistol pete it's the guns, I'm assuming. I, I don't know who voted in the <laughs> yeah. survey, but I got a feeling. I got a feeling it was. That cap gun that he's shooting off is just offensive as it could be. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Cowboys offensive. I, I, I don't know, I guess. You know, you go back to some of the. Some of the historical context. I don't know, but it, I just thought it was funny. I thought oh, I was that's, like, man. I think it's great. I feel bad for him, but uh, it's still funny nonetheless. But my loser of the week, your man, Ted, Cam Newton. Oof. Cam yep. Newton. And he, he'd he been playing well in camp. I mean, looked good in the preseason game against the Eagles. Looked like he was going to be the starter for the Patriots. But then some sort of miscommunication goes on right he goes to an out-of-state doctor but the team knows about it somehow violates the nfl's COVID 19 protocols due to some misunderstanding with the test conducted away from the facility so he has to miss practices i mean he has to miss time during a very important time leading up to the season remember he's only on a one-year deal so there and there's already reports, right? There, there's a certain level of frustration within the organization about the entire situation. And Bill Belichick was asked about it. And Belichick already said, Cam missing practice was a great opportunity for Mac Jones to show the team what he's got. And with Cam out, that is exactly what Mac Jones did, reportedly, because... He's been taking all the reps with the ones in practice and Wednesday, Mac Jones got all the first team reps in the Patriots joint practice against the giants, where according to reports, he was fantastic. Mm. 35 of 40, 
including going 21 of 24 in 11 on 11 drills, couple of touchdowns to different guys. And at one point, Ted ripped off 18 completions in a row. Wow. Pretty impressive, which by the way, someone was talking about the quarterback rating record. I was going back and looking at, at some of them and Sarkeesian's last three quarterbacks have all been over a 200 rating and Kyler wasn't 200 when he won the Heisman Baker wasn't I think Mac Jones was like 202 or 204 something crazy like that Tua was 206 so he's an efficient player we know that it sounds to me almost like Belichick when asked about it was saying we're on to Mac Jones you know, it's kind of how it felt. Yeah. We're on to Mac Jones. Uh, there's this phrase that Bill <laughs> Belichick is known for. And that phrase is do your job. And Cam Newton wasn't even there. Yeah. So that's kind of the opposite of the whole mantra for that organization. Yeah. I, I, uh, here's the thing. I don't think that I guess I don't know necessarily what they think of their team, but I, I would be surprised if they thought they had a Super Bowl caliber team. If you've got an opportunity to go with Mac Jones, develop him, you don't want to throw him to the wolves and ruin his confidence. But if you think that he's shown that he's going to be the guy in the future and you can go with him without having a, a guy that, like Cam Newton that can be unreliable, can be injury prone, then then do it. I'm not sure what his contract is, but I know it is a team-friendly contract, not a player-friendly contract with Cam Newton. So Hoyer is the other backup there. So there's a lot of people that feel like they may cut Cam Newton. Mac Jones is your starter. Brian Hoyer is a serviceable backup. Yeah, only 3.5 million guaranteed for Cam Newton, allegedly. And I don't know if they cut him before he makes the roster. Is that, is it, is that, yeah, you'd have to to make the roster first for it to be guaranteed, or I don't know how that works. Yeah, he got 2 million at signing and a 1.5 million fully guaranteed base for 2021. So we'll see. We'll see, I'm sure. And if I remember correctly, it can end up like at like 14 million or something if he hits a bunch of incentives. Like it's right. very incentive laden. So we'll see. But doesn't seem like he put himself in a good spot, man. It, it doesn't. And it's it's feeling it, like it's Mac Jones time already. Isn't it really weird though? Like, how do you miscommunicate something like that? I don't know. It's not like it's a, oh, by the way, we do have to do some COVID testing here. Well, it's, I mean, it's obvious that he's an unvaccinated guy, but that's not the issue. Like there, there should have like the plan. It should have been clear right to him. I don't know. I'm with you. I don't know how there was any misunderstanding at all. On either side. Like, I don't know how, how they were like, a okay, yeah, you can go see that doctor. Uh, Maybe they didn't know that he was as far away or whatever. Conspiracy theory. Belichick was like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you take that test. Oh, oh, you took the wrong one. Hey, Mac, you're up. (laughs) I I mean, out of what we've seen Belichick do in the past, we would not put it past him. There may be a... may, May have to look a little deeper into that contract and see what the fine print says. Yeah. We'll see. All right. On that note, episode 141 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Monday morning next week, people. Game week. Let's go. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from two to six. Okay. We need to have a talk about this. Do I have to say Sports Talk 1400 and 94.7 The Ref? Or can I just say 94.7 The Ref now? Or is it both? Uh, That's a good question. I guess both. Okay, I'll say both. Yeah. Gosh, that's a lot more talking. Fine, I guess. I'll do it for you. I guess 
oddly enough, I don't know how we're branding that whole thing, honestly. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll have clarification by the next podcast. How about that? Talk to your people. Let me know what they say <laughs> and tell them I said hello. Will do. You can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.